technology is good if it works. Here we go. So now you should be able to see our screen. Um, I'm talking here from Baltimore, um, the Dr. Johns Hopkins, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is at the moment in the news uh, very much. Uh, it was the first school of public health 104 years ago, um, and it's still the leading school. Um, we have established some 10 years ago exactly, um, also European branch, so I'm a professor at the University of Constance, and we have this uh, nice bridge, and with a policy program towards the European Parliament led by Francois Bisquet, we are regularly talking to you and trying to inform on both sides of the Atlantic about the uh, possibilities to do something. We are normally not good in social distancing, this is our group, and a lot of the things I'm presenting is done by the group. Uh, at the moment, we are working out of the lockdown as everybody does. Um, this is the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I have now had for 11 years, leaving the commission, the opportunity to work here in environmental health and also microbiology and immunology, which comes very handy at this moment, as you can imagine. Um, one of the take home messages from this 11 years of experience is that certainly Europe, from my perspective, lags behind in public health. There's no such institution like ours. Um, 2,300 students and 500 million budget. Um, that's uh, unheard of. Um, 700 professors, so one to three um, on distribution. But you also need the right government to take advantage of this. And this is one of the reasons um, to talk to you uh, to make things better than some things are handled uh, here at the moment. The first thing I would like to say is that from my point of view, everything which happened since December is a tremendous success story. Um, if you see that we had the first cases in December recognized, the, DS, the WHO was informed at, at the last day of last year. Already in, on the 10th of January, there was the first PCR published outside of China. Uh, the genome was evaluated of the virus in, on the 11th of January. We had tests in January already, uh, which are still in use. Uh, we have since March a couple of antibody tests against this. And... Um, give even the first emergency use authorizations for a drug, which seems to shorten the time, of course. If you compare this, for example, to HIV, a disease where still 38 million people are living infected and 1.7 million added every year, uh, it took from 1981 the first cases until the end of the last century in order to come to the first uh, really meaningful treatments. And this should be a lesson for us, how long it normally takes to tackle any important type of infection. So there's a medical challenge at the moment. We want drugs and vaccines, and we want them fast. And this is, at the moment, the discussion of the day. Um, we have uh, summarized a lot of the, our thinking around this in this article, which was accepted yesterday. It's an editorial in Archives of Toxicology, and those interested in details, I'm happy to share this. A lot of this is at the moment about how can we make best use of the decade-long investment into alternative approaches for drug repurposing, for target discovery, for showing the efficacy of drugs, for vaccine development, for combination therapies, because why should this be better, any better than HIV? We would need single drugs only. Drug safety, and then obviously the quality and batch control from, of vaccines and others. Um, I'm always thinking that it's not only an ethical motivation to work on alternatives. Uh, this is an article from two years ago. Um, the most important omics is economics. Uh, we entitled this. And if you look into drugs, it is a tremendously expensive thing to develop a drug. You see here how preclinical work and clinical work have skyrocketed. In the meantime, we have to assume that it's about 2 point billion to develop one successful drug. 95% um, fail in clinical phases uh, of development, and it takes us already years to get to these clinical phases with preclinical work. Um, at the same time, this is becoming more and more costly over time. Um, inflation corrected since the 50s, you get for $1 billion 80 fold less than you got in the 50s. And interestingly, this industry, which is under tremendous pressure to develop something and make it still a business is using less and less animals. Um, from 2005 and 2011 only, um, 
the industry use of these animals was about 40% less, 40% decrease in just um, six years. This is um, showing you that despite increased investment, um, there is a trend going out of these technologies. Um, all of this is happening globally. And uh, one important learning for me personally was that the US, which has only 4.25% of the world population, is consuming 64% of the drugs under patent. Um, and they're consuming 48% of all drugs in the world. And this is the reason why the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration here is more equal than others and everybody is looking to this market and how to get into this market. Um, this is quite tremendous. If you look into vaccines, uh, the situation is similar, but a little bit different. First of all, I think it's important to understand that it takes a long time to develop a vaccine, typically between eight and 18 years. And the average costs of these past projects were about 900 million euro. So similarly expensive, a little bit less perhaps. Um, it's a growth market, but it is one which is small and again 45% of revenue is made in the US um, and there's only very few companies who actually pursue this except for the small biotech so uh, most companies have actually moved out of this. Interestingly Europe dominates the vaccine world market with 80% of doses produced and 80% of these vaccines are actually exported contributing to the European surplus in, in trade um, quite, uh, quite uh, strongly. Um, however, there is problems and pharmaceutical companies have good reason to move out of, um, out of the vaccine market. Um, it is not a very attractive business if you're not highly specialized and if you're not living, want to live with very small profit margins. Um, you see here two prominent papers who analyzed this in the last decade. Uh, one said that the average um, development timeline is about 10.7 years and the chance of a market entry is only 6%. So really, it's not uh, terribly uh, in interesting. You see here years to approval for a variety of vaccines from varicella to rotavirus, and uh, these are not very encouraging timelines. Um, this all has to do also with the use of animals, because vaccine is one of the biggest users of animals. Um, a decade ago, about 15% of all animals did go into vaccine quality control. Um, this compares to about 10% which are used for toxicology, the thing we are typically talking about when about uh, talking about alternatives. And what is quite interesting to the slight decrease in success we have seen with the new statistics, and this is an article where we analyzed this in more detail, um, quality control, especially batch safety and potency testing, was one of the contributors to actually going down dramatically. Um, when I was heading the European Center for Validation of Alternative Methods, I had half a person working on this topic. And here we have saved probably half a million um, of animals um, with the variety of activities compared to essentially no change in testing uh, requirements for toxicology. So this is something which is certainly still open for a lot of improvement. So, Vaccine batch control is one of the most impressive areas of success of alternative methods. This includes a couple of activities which were prominently featured also uh, in the work on alternative methods. The next take home message I would like to give is that cell culture of today is not the cell culture people might think of. Um, cell culture you might have seen in university, um, these were petri dishes, these were cell culture flasks with some cells which looked like pen fried eggs sunny side up in a pen. Um, this has changed over the last 20 years to something which is becoming more and more organotypic, uh, something which is becoming more organ-like. And this includes the 3D cultures, the tissues and organs on chip and is moving at the moment towards humans on chip. On the right, you see two workshop reports we did develop in this area which are summarizing very nicely the state of the art. Both are available in our open access journal, Altex, for free. Also, the second one in press is already available as a pre. -thing. So what are the type of models which are now lending themselves to COVID research? Uh, first of all, you will think of lung, because that's the, that's the area um, where we are working on. Two models are very prominently commercially available. 
they can be cultured to up to a year. You see the epithetics and the MATEC models, the European and the US model, uh, which are really reproducing um, the human airways quite nicely, can be maintained. You see uh, here the complex structure, which is very much like what you, you know from textbooks about how a human lung should look like. And both of these models are being used. These are two articles already shared as preprints uh, on SARS research taking place by infecting these type of models. It's quite interesting that um, in these types of crisis, uh, everybody moves to open access, moves to early sharing, um, exactly what the EU has been pushing for. And I think this is a very, very strong indicator that this is the future of how we should do scientific work. This is an organ on ship model, which is um, was a science article in 2010 by Don Ingvers group at WIS in Harvard. And you see here how this is actually known now moving into a dynamically uh, briefing type of model, uh, which is really simulating a type of lung. And there's nice uh, videos available about this model. And again, uh, this model already uh, led to pre-publication um, on use in uh, COVID-19 and infections. And I know of several studies on the way. Um, uh, Two of these, uh, um, of these more sophisticated models, which then have been developed, are already uh, on the way into BSL-3 facilities. Um, the advances towards three-dimensional organoids uh, for all organs is incredible. Uh, the protocols are mushrooming. Um, we ourselves have prominently um, developed a brain model. We were not the first group, the third group actually, to develop a mini brain, an organoid, a ball of cells from stem cells, originally from skin of humans, but we were the first to mass produce them uh, in a standardized way, thousands of these mini brains uh, within, within a week. And uh, they show some brain functionality. These neurons are electrophysiologically talking to each other. Um, they show myelination and others. Already in 2018, we published that this model, for example, allows virus infections. Um, this is a paper on dengue and Zika virus we have done HIV in the meantime, we have done um, uh, infections with JC virus, and obviously we're now working on SARS-2 um, COVID-19. Um, it is interesting that 36% of the patients in Wuhan showed neurological symptoms. And there have been cases of virus encephalitis described. Other coronaviruses are known to infect the brain. And um, unpublished, we showed in our model last week only that we have the critical receptor for entry of the virus into the brain. And um, if this talk was next week, I probably would have the data as the infections are taking place while we are talking. And it will be very interesting since this is a model also of brain development to see whether this is affecting the brain development. Um, we have published on this model and EPA is sponsoring us for this model for brain neurodevelopmental problems. So we hope that we can identify this. Uh, best case, there's no effect on brain development, but we don't know. Uh, and the children are not born yet uh, of women infected. So we don't know actually whether there is any impact on brain development in the future as the sensitive months are the first two. The technologies are moving forward. Um, it's are moving forward to multi-organ models, hopefully at some point to human on a chip. Uh, this is work by Tissues in Berlin, uh, one of our cooperating partners who have up to four organs on a chip in, in their standard models. Um, very interesting technologies. This is uh, a technology here from, uh, from the Harvard Wiss Institute again. Their um, human on chip has up to 10 organs uh, and they are co-culturing these. And two of these devices are at the moment coming into the high level of security areas to work with uh, COVID-19 sponsored by DARPA. So you see the various chips they put together, liver, gut, kidney, and others in order to make this happen. Um, alternative methods are more than just organotypic cultures. Um, there's at the moment computational methods, there's high throughput, there's multi-omics technologies, high content. I don't have the time to discuss them. In our article we did to some extent. These are Disruptive technologies, they are making a change. They are now showing their f f that they have a very important investments into the future. Uh, so let me close with a few um, concluding remarks. Um, 
I think that first of all, the medical challenge of COVID-19 prevention and treatment illustrates the shortcomings of animal-based development and the opportunities of new technologies even more. Um, we see that it is that in order to speed up, in order to reposition quickly to do safety assessments in a timely manner to move first in humans, these methods are lending themselves to do something. Um, from my personal assessment, um, Europe clearly leads in regulation, um, but the US leads in some of the regulatory sciences. This is why we need the collaboration globally, and that's why our center tries to be a little lubricant to make this happen a bit faster. The alternative methods are developed on both sides. In the EU, more for animal welfare reasons, on the US, more for technological reasons. But um, these are enormous advances. Um, the investment into, uh, into these organs on ship type of technologies are, are close to half a billion dollar in the meantime. So they're not small compared to the investments the EU is taking. Um, and it's important that we are knowing about what each other is doing. So they are key opportunity to accelerate now drug and vaccine development. That's my strong belief. So alternative methods are enabling technologies. They allow us to do things which we often cannot do at all in these, um, in these animal models. And I think, um, as Victor Hugo said, nothing is as strong as an idea whose time has come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Thomas, for this presentation and all your uh, take-home messages. Um, Reineke, do we have some questions from the audience for Pro uh, Professor Hartung? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Anja, uh, I would like to uh, say to all the um, MEPs who are uh, attending, please let us know if you want to come in, if you want to uh, grab the microphone and ask uh, Professor Harting a question. But we also have um, a question from uh, the online uh, audience. Um, Professor Hartung, um, you said in the beginning of your speech that uh, you believe that the uh, EU lags behind in terms of public health. Um, what do you believe uh, uh, the EU could do more? So do you believe that sufficient uh, funds are being allocated also to uh, human relevant uh, models, uh, non-animal models? Um, or do you believe that the EU uh, could do more in this respect as uh, billions of uh, euros are being uh, allocated at this very moment? I mean, uh, you will never hear from a scientist there's enough money. <laughs> so don't expect this from me. Um, it is all about um, how much money you want to put into something. Um, if it is about alternative approaches, uh, I think we have seen very nicely that in the few years which I had a very strong budget from the EU um, working, uh, working in this field, we made tremendous progress. More than 20 OECD test guidelines resulted from just seven years of, of work with a relatively small group of people. And uh, draining this has led to um, a, de a deceleration in this, for example. If you talk about public health, I'm just noticing um, there is no in university of this scale for public health. And it's a good reason why you, everybody refers at the moment to the Johns Hopkins data, because they were prepared for exactly doing this. They're giving the advice. But this type of advice is followed is then a political instrument. And um, the basic idea in, of Bill Welch 104 years ago when he created this school of public health was that you should physicians who are making money by treating patients should not be the ones to prevent the disease. That's the idea of public health, to separate these two. I think it's still a strong one. And one of the lessons learned is that I think strong public health advising policymakers also. Um, so at the interface between science and policy is a very important instrument. And it is not made use of enough here. And um, I think uh, Europe could strengthen this infrastructure quite, uh, quite, uh, quite nicely. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. And uh, as you will be well, well aware of, there is a lot of discussion at the moment uh, about the importance of uh, strengthening the EU's health uh, policy. Um, and uh, we have um, an uh, MEP who would like to come in, Eleonora Evi. 
Could you unmute, your, um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, thank you and good morning everybody. Thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. I would like to ask uh, a, a question. Um, as we know uh, from 2020 Commission's report uh, on the protection of animals used for scientific purposes, that the evaluation and authorization of projects involving animals uh, are not always sound processes and that research uh, involving animals still takes place uh, when other methods are available, as the ones you have shown uh, today. Uh, the question is, how can we improve the focus of the collaborative efforts on the COVID-19 to make sure that they robustly assess uh, the scientific and technical merits and the ethical aspects of any proposed research before they receive the funding? I also would like to point out that we, as an MEP, we sent out a letter to the uh, commissioner, uh, head commissioner, uh, head commissioner uh, Kiriakides and uh, Gabriel, and also to the EMA uh, uh, agency, uh, pointing out exactly the need to uh, basically boost and encourage the adoption of new approaches and when feasible, uh, uh, straight uh, uh, to human vaccine and drug trials. Uh, as we all ha have the, um, uh, I mean, as there are a lot of alternatives uh, uh, out there uh, that are not used. Uh, we, re we received a reply from the EMA and EMA um, actually uh, replied us that they are making significant contributions toward the elimination of uh, repetitious and unnecessary animal testing within the EU. But still, they, uh, of course, uh, uh, underline that there are certain types of data that can, that can and should only be generated by means of animal studies. And uh, in, in this case, then uh, revealing and confirming the same approaches, the same paradigm, I would, I would, I would say. Uh, but they also saying that they're trying to make step forward on, for example, uh, the advices to developers to leverage knowledge accumulated with platform technology to accelerate the development of uh, COVID-19 vaccine um, made upon the existing toxicology and clinical data obtained from the medicines used uh, using uh, the same platform without uh, the need to repeat certain studies. So, uh, sorry for being very lengthy, but just to say that um, there seems to be same business as usual approach and how can we boost and how can we uh, make some step forward in the direction you are telling us. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I know your letter and uh, I would like to compliment uh, for this because I think it addresses a lot of important points. I think there's a lot of um, goodwill um, everywhere. And there's also a lot of lip service everywhere, uh, but the practice is disappointing. Um, my own claim to fame is a pyrogen test, for example, uh, an assay which has been using a decade ago about 170,000 rabbits per year uh, in, uh, to be replaced in, in Europe. And it has took me now 25 years to see this decline to reason more reasonable numbers, but it's still not abandoned. And the reason for this is that have always been doing it like this. The system is so resistant to the change. So it is refreshing to see how everybody is at this very moment moving towards these new technologies and are applying them because when they really, when it really counts, they suddenly are uh, lending themselves to, to be used. And this is something we should find instruments for. We need to enforce that if there is a method available, it has to be used. And Europe stops sh short, short here because they accept that people say, yeah, but there's still an important market we have to deliver the animal test. And for this reason, I do the animal test and we are continuing doing it. If we would force to use the alternative method in Europe, independent of what others are asking for, we would create the data, we would create the experiences and the market pressures to actually move other important areas. This is not taking place. And I think we should ask ourselves, why can we suddenly use for important decision taking um, these new methodologies for something which is life threatening like, uh, like the coronavirus, if it was not possible for decades to use the very same methodologies for uh, in, other, in other instances.
Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, with those uh, strong words and a very clear uh, message, uh, we need to move on, unfortunately. Um, there um, are a, bit, a couple of more questions uh, in the chat. Uh, we hope to come uh, back to you uh, later. Uh, but now, Anya, it's time to introduce our second uh, speaker. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Thomas, uh, for your uh, very enlightening presentation. Yeah, please send me emails. I'm happy to answer any question. Oh, uh, wonderful. Fly. Thanks a lot.